God bless you, everybody, and we welcome you to the Springfield Baptist Church here in Conyers, Georgia. We bid you a, a beautiful holy week in the presence of our Lord, and we thank God uh, for the technology that unites us uh, on this day before the highest holy days of our walk with Jesus Christ. I do want to thank God uh, that there's no one church and no one preacher no one denomination that has a monopoly on the Holy Spirit, uh, nor a monopoly on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I thank God for all of the preachers who join me in the responsibility of proclaiming and explaining the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I thank God uh, for the three preachers that have gone before me and the three preachers that will come after me and the churches that they give leadership to. We praise God for each and every one of them. And certainly we praise God for the leader uh, that unites us in this broadcast on this uh, Good Friday afternoon. And we praise God for each and every one of you that are watching and worshiping alongside us. I want to make the most of our time, and so we're going to go directly to God's word. The fourth word is found in the gospel according to Matthew, the 27th chapter. I'm going to read verses 45 and 46, where the Bible declares from the Holman Christian Standard Bible, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be unto our God. I'd like to take as a subject with your prayers and with God's authority, the subject is at the peak of the pain, at the peak of the pain. In the opening scenes of Matthew's gospel in chapter number two, Jesus' birth is marked by a supernatural light, a star that shone, that was, that was shining bright at midnight. Uh, that star guided the Magi to the manger in Matthew chapter 2 and in a dramatic contrast 25 chapters later in Matthew chapter 27 his death is marked by supernatural darkness at noon the Bible says that uh, lonely the loneliness of Christ is accentuated by the darkness in the sky and so at birth uh, light was shining when it should have been dark. But at death, darkness has taken over when it should have been light. Now we find ourselves uh, in this saga that we've come to know as Good Friday, uh, recognizing the startling crescendo of cataclysmic events that take place prior to this moment. Judas has already be betrayed Jesus. Peter has already denied him three times. Ten disciples have fled and forsaken him. He's been brutalized and tortured and maimed. And his precious cleansing blood is escaping his veins as I preach. Exhausted up all night carrying his own cross up the Via Della Rosa, up to Golgotha's hill. Nailed him to the cross. We've come to realize, as some biologists and, and, and medical professionals have told us, that it must have been excruciating pain because when you nail someone's hands to a cross, the median nerve causes there to be almost unbearable pain. And what is perhaps the apex of the agony the peak of his pain, the sky which ought to be blue is immediately going dark. And in the context of this dramatic crescendo of unfortunate events, Jesus utters these words, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Y'all, we're being told that as it relates 
to this global pandemic, which has us at a place where we can't even come and worship on Good Friday. This week, sh we should be prepared, the professionals are telling us, because this week, uh, the pain is going to reach its peak. A phalanx of medical experts and epidemiologists and infectious disease specialists have declared that this week is going to be hell on earth. The data entered into their projection models have all concluded that this very week that we're in, we will see catastrophic consequences of COVID-19 for which there is no cure. The U.S. Surgeon General confirmed this when he said uh, that this week is going to be like Pearl Harbor. It will surpass the tragic loss of 9-11. It will be a deadly time in America. Those two things, those two historic events are some of the most deadly weeks in American history. And he says we're going to surpass that this week. This is the week that American pain will reach its peak and and even a president whose responses to the pandemic have been riddled with delays and denials and dysfunction and lies and accusations and misinformation and misdirection. Even the president acknowledges with the vocabulary of a fourth grader, there'll be lots of deaths that I can tell you. A direct, a direct quote from our president, there'll be lots of deaths that I can tell you. I don't think, I don't think, I don't think it's a coincidence that the peak week of our pandemic is the same week that we remember the peak of Jesus' pain. That I don't think it's an accident that, that the apex of the national agony is the same week that Christians everywhere are thinking and studying and preaching and teaching about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. To me, I consider this... Uh, fourth word to be the most theologically challenging of all of the seven utterances and and I'm reminded of the great thinker and the great believer and the great Christian Dr. John Cobb who in his book uh, Becoming a Thinking Christian says that we're surrendering too much to the experts we're, we're always surrendering to the education experts and to the, to the medical experts and to the physicians and, and to, but when it comes to spiritual formation dr cobb says we've got to do our own theology nobody can do our theology for us and so no matter how well these seven preachers preach the gospel today you've got to do your own theology you can't do theology without asking questions and this is the most theologically troubling for me of all of the seven utterances because jesus who is full Fully human and Jesus who is fully divine asks a question and the question suggests that God has indeed forsaken him. Oh, let's not gloss over the controversy that we're left with. Let's not gloss over it. Uh, the fact that Jesus asked this question is theologically difficult. It is, it is a theological dilemma. And if we believe the construct of the question, if we believe the assertion that Jesus is the son of God and the son of man, then how can God forsake God's self? All we have is Jesus' question, and there's no response to the question. We just have a question. So, so let's take Jesus at his word, and let's assume that God has forsaken Jesus. Let's, let's assume that, 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 that the godly properties of Jesus, uh, the godly essence of Jesus, has somehow separated and detached itself from the humanity of Jesus. 
Jesus. Let's assume, let's just take the premise of the question, indeed, that God has separated himself from Jesus. Y'all, it begs another question because you can't do theology without asking questions. If we ought to believe this theological assertion of separation, then we, then we have to ask another question. Why would God uh, in Jesus separate from Christ during the peak of his pain? Why would God uh, separate God's self from Jesus when the pain is at its peak? Why would God separate from Christ when the agony is at its apex? Y'all, that's a tough question, but I'm glad you asked because I do have an answer. There is a word from the Lord and here's the word from the Lord. Here's the answer. This is why God has to separate God's self from Jesus before Jesus dies because God cannot die those of us who are saved by the blood of the lamb we need Jesus to die because to live is Christ and to die is gain and if God were capable of dying we would have a real theological crisis on our hands in order for Jesus to achieve death divinity has to withdraw at some point during the process of crucifixion if there were no withdrawal the execution would be impossible because only humans can have peak pain there is no peak to the pain that God can endure he can do anything but fail and God cannot die if Jesus could be hanging, Jesus could have been hanging from the cross forever if there was no separation of his divinity and his humanity. And so it was necessary for a separation because God cannot die. And y'all, as a result of there being a separation between the divinity of God, the divinity of Jesus, and the humanity of Jesus, we get what some people call an immersion, an emotional outburst from Jesus from the cross some would suggest uh, that Jesus' fourth word is an emotional outburst from his humanity made at the peak of his pain an outburst that announced that there had been a separation from the divinity of Jesus and the humanity of Jesus and y'all I'm alright with that description I'm alright with Jesus having outbursts Peter Scazzaro in emotionally healthy spirituality says that Christians need to stop masking their emotions and we need to start growing through our emotions we need to become more mature through our emotions because our emotions teach us they inform us how we can improve Jesus has emotional outbursts and Alicia Britt Cholet in her book entitled 40 days of decrease has to remind us that Jesus weeps over Jerusalem at the entry into Jerusalem she teaches us that holy can grieve and still be holy she says that Jesus clears the temple she says holy can get angry and still be holy Jesus curses a fig tree thank God that you can be holy and you can be your holy can curse and you can still be holy in the garden of Gethsemane he had a moment of, of anxiety and he agonized you can be holy and agonize and still be holy and to this list I add you can have anxiety on the cross and still be holy, y'all. There are too many of us. We need Jesus. Uh, we need Jesus to, to not lose it. We need Jesus to always have it together. But y'all, there are times that Jesus cursed. There are times he got angry. There are times he grieved. There are times he wept. wept. There are times he agonized. And there is time that he had anxiety. And so some people would say that this is Jesus giving us an emotional response in the peak of his pain Jesus is not just being emotional however Jesus is also being biblical because Jesus is not just shouting a sentiment an emotion he's also shouting scripture so what looks like a panic is really his praise 
the reason I know it's praise is because uh, he's quoting a psalm and he's quoting Psalm 22 verse number one the question he asks Eli Eli Lama Sabachthani he's quoting what David wrote in Psalm 22 and one my God my God why has thou forsaken me in verse number two he says crying and uh, i'm crying and you don't hear me and, and in the daytime and in the nighttime i'm crying out for you and it's like you don't hear me but if you keep on reading then in verse number three of psalm 22 it says but you are holy but you inhabit the praises of your people but my ancestors trusted on you and you delivered me but they cried out to you and you delivered them but they trusted you and they, and they were not confounded by you I know we're in a peak of, of, of our pain I know we're in the midst of a pandemic but I want to challenge you today I know that death is everywhere I know we are surrounded by sickness uh, but, 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 but God promised that he would never leave us and he promised that he would never forsake us and I just got a feeling that everything is going to be alright so bring on the fifth word but before I go I got a question does anybody have a pandemic proof praise like Jesus Christ Pastor Lee what's a pandemic proof praise a pandemic proof praise says I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth a pandemic praise says hallelujah anyhow a pandemic praise says though they slay me yet will I trust him glory glory hallelujah is there anybody here that can give God the praise at the time when the pain is at its peak God bless you God keep you there is a great getting up morning.